<laughs> the obnoxious announcement. And I'm going to let everyone in. There's about 21 people in our waiting room. Oh, great. Wow. <laughs> they come. Welcome everyone. Thank you for your patience as we navigate this tech world. <laughs> Right. Well, I'm going to keep my eye on the waiting room and let people in as they trickle on through, but I don't want to take up too much more time because we have an hour and there's a fantastic panel of folks that are ready to answer some questions. Uh, so I'm just going to start things off by doing a land acknowledgement. ECMA would like to acknowledge sorry, uh, that we are all in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. Our artists, staff, and supporters acknowledge the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognize that we are all treaty people. Um, I'm also going to acknowledge the support from our province of Nova Scotia, where I'm located, <laughs> uh, Cape Breton Municipality, Factor, Music Action, and the Government of Canada through the Department of Canadian Heritage. And I'd also be remiss if you don't notice my background. We are sponsored, our conference this year is sponsored by TD. Uh, and it is because of TD that we are able to offer this conference free of charge to all delegates that want to attend. So we're really grateful for that. Um, we want as many of you folks to join us as possible and it's because of them. So without further ado, this is our first official panel of ECMA week 2021. Oh, <laughs> uh, we skipped a year, now we're in 2021, imagine that. Uh, and we've got a great um, assortment of folks uh, that are ready to share their perspectives, their, uh, give you a little bit of information on their role, answer some questions that were provided in advance, as well as others that we just sort of think you guys might want to have asked but hadn't. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and leading us through this discussion is Janesta Boudreau. Uh, Janesta has been a part of our world here in the East Coast music scene for a long time and has been a friend of the ECMAs. Uh, she seemed like the perfect person to ask to moderate this panel. Um, and for any of you that don't know, Janesta Boudreau is owner director at Rocking Horse Road Productions, a Canadian music licensing house with strong European presence, providing music supervision and and licensing services for video games, film, TV, and advertising. So I'm going to just hand it over to Janesta and we'll get this show started. Hooray. Thank you, Allison. Right. So to start, um, I've been sort of watching AMAs happen in the music industry world for a little while now. It seems sort of as the pandemic hit, um, people took a little step back and could ask some questions and some soups were up for you know, answering them. Um, and in reading some of these questions, I realized that there are things that people don't know that they don't know they don't know. So things like an AMA are actually really helpful. So I think first we should just start by introducing everybody or you can introduce yourselves um, a little bit about where you are in the world and uh, what you do. So we'll start with uh, Amelia, please. Hi, so I run a company called AM Studios um, and AM Licensing. Um, so AM Studios is all about developing artists. Um, I've been doing that for nearly 10 years. And a couple of years ago, I set up AM Licensing and we offer um, music supervision, licensing, clearances and mentoring. Um, we're based in the UK, but all of our work is global. Sophie, I see you next. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, I'm Sophie Urquhart, I am a music supervisor based in London. Um, I've been a music supervisor for about 16 years and almost 10 years ago I set up my own company Tin Drum Music. So we're a, a fully independent uh, full music consultancy, so specialising in music search, 
uh, original composition, music licensing, negotiation, and, and contracting and paperwork as well. Um, I predominantly work in the, the advertising sector, but also do do uh, feature films and, and a bit of TV as well. Awesome. Mark, you're next. Unmute myself. There we go. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, my name is Mark. I've been in the sync and licensing supervision space for the last 10 years, uh, mostly focusing on um, short form stuff like film trailers and TV promos and advertising. In the last four years, I've been independent and I'm based in the US, so I work on US stuff as well as European stuff and mostly, as I say, specialized folks on advertising music searches. So doing kind of um, tools for people like finding songs and negotiation, licensing and stuff like that. Um, and then alongside that, separate to that, I have a, a sync licensing, sync representation side of my business where I pitch artists, film and TV. But I'd say they're, they're kind of completely separate. So it's, um, it's uh, just something I've managed to do along the way over the years. So yeah. Nice. Um, and then Victoria, please. Hi, uh, I work for Entertainment One. Um, I've been there coming on five years as a music supervisor. We work mainly film and TV. Uh, I'm based in Toronto, so most of the stuff we do is US and Canadian productions. And yeah. Awesome. Everyone has an accent. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so I think um, I just want to jump right in. Some questions may lead to a longer little conversation. Some will sort of just lead me to the next question. So I'll jump around my page a bit. But uh, the first question we have is from Beverly. And it says, my question in regards is in regards to TV ads, as ads are my main focus. I've noticed uh, that they run the gamut from covers to classical, rock, indie, etc. Can the music supervisors let us know what music works best for ads and what gets noticed by music supervisors? I can go, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that quickly. Um, I think, so. Um, yeah, I've been doing music searches for ads the really big brands for the last three years. And it's interesting because obviously there's, there's trends and there's things that come and go, but I think consistently, you know, it's, um, I mean, there's a big, I think one of the struggles, especially for up and coming artists is obviously, you know, with advertising, they don't want to be nice to see them something famous. And that obviously, um, you know, obviously if you're not famous or, you know, that's, that's a struggle in terms of trying to, you know, there's so many decision makers in the ad process. If you land it at anyway, it's a, it's a miracle, and it should be seen as that. But <laughs> it's a very, it's a very challenging space, and I think um, the the big things I kind of, if something really piques my interest, is like things that are just really well produced, and um, things that have percussive elements, things that have lots of sections um, in terms of you know peaks and props, you know different elements rather than just like a one one lane kind of track is what I think often does well. Um, but I think especially in the ad world, it's it, it is very challenging to to land kind of independent artists. Um, it's just because there's, there's so many people involved, and you know they'll they'll just want to use the, either the reference track or there's someone else picks the song and things like that. So yeah. And can oh sorry, go ahead, so I was just gonna just gonna add to that. Um, I mean, in advertising, it's generally all the briefs are quite broad in terms of the genres that we really use, as you, as you said in your question. But there are very common traits that come up a lot because it's advertising. It needs to have mass appeal. Really, they're they're paying a lot of money to appeal to as many people as they can to buy their brand or go on their holiday or whatever it is they're advertising. So bear that in mind as well. So. In terms of um, lyrics, I mean, what's often very used is non-specific lyrics. So, so it's not about anything, you know, that you have to really tie into a script, which can work. But generally, if it's feelings of togetherness or, or travel or that sort of thing, those are things that get picked up a lot. Um, and obviously, again, because, because we're selling, a product to a, to an audience, it, it needs to be positive and feel good. Um, perhaps you know, tug at some emotional strings, uh, be engaging, have momentum. So so whether it's famous or not, I, I would bear those things in mind for advertising. When you're in the film and TV world, you can be far more brave in terms of the lyric content and the the style of music. But 
it's generally a more uh, it's a safer area for advertising because they don't want to put anyone off right because they're trying to sell something and make fee people feel something rather than just making exactly. people feel something um one thing that much. one thing that um I was wondering if you can elaborate on, and it also goes for film and television. Um, I am assuming everybody knows what a reference track is and why that is a start point, but why does uh, a reference track come up and why don't they just use that? I can type this up. Yeah, so I think um, the reference track is you know, it's a very easy way of someone trying to get across what they're looking to achieve in terms of whether it's tonally or, um, you know, the, the lyrical content or how, you know, how it makes someone feel. And I think the, you know, briefs, briefs can be as simple as just a reference track. People can just say, look, this is a song we have at the moment or the song we're in love with that we can't afford it. And then you can use that, you know, but again, a lot of this, is you, you're just trying to interpret what the, I think that's what's interesting and is, is always a challenge is that you're just constantly trying to it's a constant interpretation of what someone's saying or distilling information down especially when it comes to a record track and especially especially when you're working internationally is trying to figure out what someone means by indie rock or what someone means by you know you need to make them feel this or you know they can give you just one or two words to go on and it can be very challenging to try and interpret that and try and figure out what they really mean by that so i think the but the reference track is usually a good steer of like where they're looking and um, kind of like what where their heads are, I guess. Um, but it just it just as you say, it's, it's all just an interpretation of, of that. You know, you can get four reference tracks, and you have to kind of use your experience to distill that down into okay, well, I'm going to send these ideas, or just even just when it comes down to if they tell you, you know, budget's really restricted, and you kind of have to figure out whether to ignore that because you know that they're going to find the money somewhere or, you know, you see, you know, you work on something and the budget's really limited and then the spot airs and it has a huge song on it and you think, well, hang on a minute, they told me to keep it within a limit. So it's, you have to kind of just, yeah, you, I mean, you use your experience and then I think both people would agree, like no, no projects are the same in that, in that kind of process. And you did say, Mark, that within the advertising sphere, especially, there are people in addition to a music supervisor who are sort of steering the conversation and what the needs are. Uh, is that the same, anyone can answer this one, um, between sort of television and film, ads, trailers, et cetera? Because I know that a lot of people do think that a music supervisor gets free reign to pick songs and you know, put them in, um, but is that always the case? No. Uh, ultimately, um, in my experience, um, it's for the film that I'm working on at the moment, it's the director's decision. So I will curate songs, um, give suggestions, put them across, but ultimately it's going to be the director's decision on what gets used. Yeah, and um, in TV it is up to the showrunner and often they will write the song they want into the script. And then they're so attached to it that you that they really want to try and have it, um, and it usually doesn't work because of budget, especially on Canadian stuff. But yeah, they, I find that they often get really attached to the songs that they want, and yeah, sometimes it is hard to give them a, a replacement for it. Mm. And what would you say between the actual creative part and the actual paperwork and licensing? and negotiation and finding people and who owns the song part, mm -hmm. um, does your job sit? Is it sort of 50-50 or is it more licensing? It's, it's definitely more like admin. I would say it's probably like 75% admin, 25% creative. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of negotiations that go on, um, a lot of back and forth with everyone. So yeah, and it changes on each production. Like sometimes they're just, they're open to us being really creative and and you know, um, giving them options and they usually work, but sometimes you work with people and they just want what they want. Yeah, I think that's a good point about the, so it's a, I think that's a great point in terms of the, the, the directors and the, you know, you're kind of 
part of your role as the supervisor on film and TV is to facilitate, you know, facilitate the, the director's dream and kind of help guide that, especially when it comes to, you know, cutting into two, you know, you have obviously start with a wish list usually and then you kind of have to cut it down usually pretty substantially. So obviously, um, you know, it's, as you say, I'm sure for some projects you get a lot more free reign, especially if budgets are limited. You can kind of put in a bunch of suggestions and actually, you know, work with them to, to find, you know, things that are going to fall in line. Uh, especially after like Canadian TV, obviously the budgets are more limited. So you have to be a bit more creative. Mm -hmm. So do you find that generally you're more a part of a, even though there's a lot of us independents or companies that do supervision and licensing, um, it is more of a team, there's a team aspect to making an ad or a film or a, you know, you don't just run around and plug songs in and have to go through a whole. Well, I, I would say, I mean, cause I say I predominantly work in advertising. I do find that very different to the film work I do, for example, with advertising, you're mm -hmm. looking for one track. It's very important that that one track, as I said before, is going to appeal to the biggest audience possible. Um, so you need to get it right. So there's an awful lot of the search search side of things, a lot of back and forth with feedback, trying different routes, um, that sort of thing. And then it's quite faceless though, I have to say. So so you deal with, a, as a supervisor, I deal with a, an agency producer, um, pitch to them, then they, then they then go to the creatives, the the CEO at the agency who then goes to the client, who then goes, there's many levels of people that this track has to be approved by as well, which is why it can sometimes take a long time because it's so subjective, you know, what I could think is perfect for their script, they could think is totally off. So, so there's lots of levels, faceless levels until it just gets to the point where the producer says this one and then we start the negotiations on that. Whereas where I'm, when I'm doing a film job, like the other guys said, you know, I'm working closely with the director. It's a very creative um, role in, uh, you know, in terms of discovering what the film needs together. The, the director will have a load of ideas. You are more there as a sort of what's realistic with your budget and your terms. And, you know, if you're working on an MFN deal, what's going to not work alongside that? Um, so, so it's more sort of collaborative in that way and the producer will be involved in the conversation as well. Um, some people literally just do the creative side, some will follow through and do all of the negotiation and licensing as well. Um, but yeah, that's the difference. And also with a film, of course, you're clearing a number of tracks. So, so it's, I wouldn't say it's less important, of course, everything has to be perfect, but, there's a, but you might have a lot more sort of filler, as it were, rather than your key your key scene tracks, which are, which are like as important as the ad tracks. I think you brought up something that I, I don't know what the whole crowd here knows about F MFN. Um, I still get asked all the time. So maybe uh, Victoria, since you're in television and you probably have to abide by MFN quite a bit, can you explain what that actually means? Yeah, um, basically it means that, so if the publisher approves their side and they'll usually say MFN with master, it means that if they've been approved at this fee and then the master will approve at a higher fee, then the publishing will automatically get that higher fee. And so sometimes they will, it means most favoured nations, um, usually they will MFN with master and publishing, but if it is low budget and we, um, we often try and do like MFN, the whole film, say, excluding main and end titles and montages and things like that. So yeah, they're just covering themselves so they get paid the same if anyone else pushes the fee higher. Yeah. So if you say have, for, for argument's sake, $100 per song, then if somebody comes in and says, I can't do it less for 500, then 500, you either have to raise everybody yeah. to 500 or say no we can't do it we only have 100 per track yeah exactly we'll just like put a library track in or something we usually yeah. tell them so that's that's actually good info i think for the crowd um and it, it's worth even asking especially if you're not um front or end titles if um if it's mfn with the rest of the tracks in the show um you never know maybe it'll bump you up maybe it won't but it's 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 good to know those things are, it's a terminology, it is used, it is 
good info. Um, so you were talking, Sophie, about you know films and having to work with the, a, the director and realizing their vision. But I know that you've worked on a, at least one documentary in particular. And I always assumed when I was young that if you're making a documentary of say the Backstreet Boys, um, they're starring in it. They already know it's about their life. It's about their songs. Is that not an easy job? Uh, you'd think so. <laughs> um, the reality, I've done quite a few uh, music documentaries actually, and the reality is they can quite often be a much harder job than, than a regular, than a fiction film. Um, and the reason is, I mean, obviously you're right, that if the artist knows it's happening, it's good exposure for them, it's telling their story. So in terms of the approval side of things, that's generally much easier. You know, the, the, the concept is obvious and, and they want to use, they need to, sh to showcase the music from their career. However, the difficulties come in that there's an awful lot more music you're clearing. For the, I, for the Backstreet Boys film I did, there was 130 cues where I would say on average, there's probably 20, you know, um, and it was because that it was just constant footage, live performances, um, you know, new uh, interviews, all of that sort of thing. And also it, within that, there are very, lots of different licensing um, rules and processes. So, so it actually becomes quite complex. <laughs> um, whereas, a, whereas in, in a regular film, it would just be, you know, you're clearing background music of an existing master. So, um, so it can be complicated. And also the other thing to bear in mind is that the, the artists don't always write their own music shock horror you know um like again backstreet boys and stone roses i did there's there's lots of writers behind the scenes who produce and write alongside them um so you know there's there's also another issue where because the artist is getting a lot of um exposure and and sync sync action within the film a writer might have you know, 10% on something on one track. So is it fair for them to get an MFN with the artist who's getting an awful lot of money for the for the same usage? So so there are there are different complications um, for sure. But as I said, you know, if generally because it's because of the subject matter, you can get over things that way, you know, if the, the stone roses, then obviously the writers are fans of the band and they want to support them. So so that's kind of your your negotiation leverage on a, on a music documentary, I would say. Have you ever had anybody who has a small, small percentage of the song who said no, which makes the whole thing go away? Absolutely. Mm. Have you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have as well. Okay, that, I was just that brings working up on... a really, I was going to say, go ahead. Some I want to hear your horror stories now, so go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, it happens so much in hip hop. Like we oh, okay. just did a couple of episodes for Behind the Music. Um, one of them's on LL Cool J. We had to pre-clear like 80 songs and just the time it takes to find all the writers. And we had this one guy, he owned like half the song on one of LL's songs. And he just was like, no, I don't want to do it for these fees because I want to send this contract to my lawyer and it's going to cost me like way more that I'm getting um, uh, for the fee. Um, and it, yeah, it was MFN, all songs in episode pro rata to their share. But um, yeah, it's just been a kind of nightmare. And it happens with like a 1%, there was a Fat Joe episode and um, he co-wrote a lot of songs with Big Pun and then Big Pun's estate denied all of them because of some beef they had. And one song he owned like, you know, one and a half percent on or whatever. So that's when we had to get Fat Joe's management to talk to Big Pun's estate and kind of smooth it over and coordinate with the publishers because sometimes they say no, even though the artists have said yes. So it's just like, it can be quite messy. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's a good, a good point of, uh, yeah, just getting your, getting your ducks in a row when you're co-writing with people. And I think the big thing is obviously a lot of people don't put agreements in place and it's, and it's all just on kind of conversational. And I work with some artists where they, it's definitely, I've had to do some handholding in terms of you know, explaining, look, if you, if 
you co-wrote it, then they need to get a percentage of the think fee or whatever. You know, there's lots of things to kind of figure out. And I think doing it as early as possible is obviously very helpful because otherwise you run into so many issues down the line or people fall out, people lose touch. It's like it's really, it can get really complicated, especially when you're trying to land those things. That's a really great point. Um, I always say that it might be uncomfortable to get things put in writing, but it's way more uncomfortable later when there's actually money on the line and you're arguing over splits or getting paid. Just, you know, go. Yeah. Go for a coffee or a beer and write it down. <laughs> yeah. I was, um, I had an issue. I was hired by a client in Asia to clear a song by a major artist and it was a nightmare from the get-go. The artist was trying to claim full ownership over the song, even though there was another writer and there was a label attached and he was trying to say the label didn't have any rights to the track either, which they did. Um, I managed to get a lot of the parties signed off and the artist was responsible for signing off his own publishing. So that was the only thing left to clear. And just as we're finally getting to the finish line, I get a call from someone saying, you know that artist that you've been trying to clear that song for? And I'm like, yeah. And they were like, well, you need to check out the news because they're just been arrested for a really serious charge. <laughs> and this is not like, for, <clears throat> it was a hip hop artist. It wasn't for like a little bit of weed or something like that. This is like a really, really serious charge, like going down for a long time potentially. And I'm like, no, are you serious? Um, a few days later though, the artist WhatsApped me and I'm like, how have you ever managed to message me after you've just been arrested on this serious charge? So anyway, it's, uh, it's still ongoing. I'm still trying to clear that track, so. <laughs> really? Oh, wow. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah nightmare that's that's a big one <laughs> yeah anyone else have artists <laughs> it's, it's definitely worth like mark said it's a really important thing so you know you could have 99 percent of a track but check that one percent i mean um it's it's it, it because if it's if there's any um, issues with it, then you can't use the track at all. Of course, no. one hundred percent of everything needs to be fully cleared and approved at the same rates for anything to go ahead. So it can really jeopardize you. Um, and yeah, I think it's a common misconception that you know um, uh, small tracks are easier or lesser known are easier to clear. It's not. It's not always the case. I think one of my most difficult ones was a was a small budget folk track. Um, and there was a massive family feud uh, involving ex-wives and all sorts, like fighting over who thought they owned the rights to it. And, and again, it got so far into this that we that we lost that. Actually, no, we did find we did we did manage to make everyone kiss and make up at the end and agree to it. But 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 yeah, it's it's definitely it's one of those things that you know very often someone will go, we want this track, great, go and get it for us, and and that's why you hire a supervisor because because it's crucial to just look into every legality of it. Otherwise, you can face massive massive um, copyright issues and infringement laws um, if you don't do it properly. So. Yeah, that's a very good point. It, this is not on my ask me anything sheet, but um, <laughs> you being the music supervisor and making sure that everything's cleared properly, this means that anyone hiring you to do so is trusting you, you legally that they won't get sued. Is that true? Yes, you're, you're acting as the middleman between the licensee and the licensor. So based on your experience and your legal um, advice and everything like that, you, you will be the one who's negotiating the deal, writing up the contract and ensuring that all of the right legal terms are in place in order to, for that to happen. But, but we're not signing it, essentially. It's between the advertising agency and, and the artist um, we're, who will sign, sign the contract, but we're, but we're facilitating yeah, I think it's funny that some people don't realize that it's it can be a very stressful job. Of course, it's a fun job. There's a lot of fun, you know, bits to it. But when you're dealing with um, legal rights, it's actually a pretty big deal that you get it right. So music supervisors who tend to complain that, you know, you didn't label that properly or whatever, um, there is a reason for it and not just that it makes 
things easier at the end of the day. It just makes things also um, less likely that we'll get somebody sued, <laughs> which is always a good thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. That, I mean, it's um, I think that's what I've noticed, especially as, uh, especially up and coming artists um, who obviously you know they work with a producer, they give the producer five, ten percent, something like that, and then they kind of don't realise how that may may impact either sync licensing or they don't even have any kind of agreements in place about you know what happens if you land a sync. But the thing is, obviously, just you're trying to get a song done, you want some help. And that's been, I've definitely helped people in that sense in terms of just figuring it out. Because um, obviously, you know, when we when we talk about this stuff, we've been doing it a long time and we say these things that they're like second nature. But it's interesting because you do really, you know, even recently um was working with an artist from Denmark and they didn't, they just, they'd done a similar thing where they, someone had produced the vocals on a track and they had, they'd given them a percentage of the, you know, the royalty. They're just saying, oh, we gave them the raw, some of the royalty. And it's like, well, yes, if that's heading me to thinking, you know, you were talking about they're registered on the PRO, but, you know, they're registered as a writer. So, you know, you have to, you have to decide, because especially if you land a big thing and there's a lot of money involved, it could get missed. You know, they, if they see that on TV and they didn't get any money for it, mm. and they technically are listed as a writer, you know, that could get very complicated in terms of, you know, whether that's, you know, there's, there's, you know, again, it's like all these kind of handshake deals, and it's, as you, as Jessica said, they're difficult conversations to have. Uh, but I think people are more educated than ever about this sort of thing, hopefully, you know, in terms of um, generally speaking, just with all the information available and it's, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that complicated necessarily, but it's definitely, you know, they're difficult conversations to have, especially when you're trying to figure these things out. Um, as, Sophie, I think as, Sophie, you know, as you can kind of hear from everyone, it's like the, the job is, is so admin heavy sometimes. I think the, the role of a music supervisor is just such, goes from literally just like, this very kind of abstract creative process that, you know, here's a reference track, do me a search based on this in the next hour, which people can do because they've been doing it a long time, versus, you know, just this pure like 120 hues, 10 writers trying to find, you know, needle in the haystack stuff is, is you know, it, it can be really interesting and just like being a detective, but it's also, yeah, you're up against the deadline, you have a budget. You know, people get upset when things get denied, which is always a fun one. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it can be a lot. Uh, guys, I just noticed that there are actually, there's a chat window, people asking questions. So I will ask some of these questions as well. Um, Beverly says, do the music supervisors send briefs out to licensing agencies with libraries or do they ever work directly with the artists? That's for anybody. Um, Go on, <laughs> uh, for me, um, just to give you a bit of a reality of it, like the, we get very short amount of time to deliver a search now. We used to get a luxury like week long. So I'd love to do really, you know, deep research, speak to artists and all of that. The reality now is, is no time. So based on that, if I was to brief out to everyone, I just wouldn't have any time to go through it all and, and do my own search and that sort of thing. So now I, I do brief out, not all of them, um, but, but it's generally to the, the larger and trusted publishers and labels and sync reps. Um, so for independent artists, I would highly recommend sync reps um, because they're, they're people that supervisors trust. Um, they know how to respond to a brief well. Um, so it's really all time, time management. Sometimes if it's a very specific brief, um, and I know artists in that world or, you know, like I come to fe festivals and conferences and, and particularly global ones and get to know a territory quite well and a sound, then, then I will do much more focused uh, briefing to them. Um, but, but yeah, it, as, a, as a whole, we also get pitched, you know, on average, 100 emails a day with people pitching their music. So it's, it's just, it, it's useful for people to hear the realities of it. And that's why quite often you don't get a response from people. It doesn't mean that they're not listening and they're not paying attention. It's just, it's just the, the sheer amount there's, you know, and people can release from their bedrooms these days. So there's, there's no sort of filter as such. So it's, it's overwhelming at times, the amount of music coming in. So it's, it's really about finding the people that you trust that will pitch well to your briefs and save you time in the long run. 
Yeah, I think yeah. that's interesting. Sorry, I was just no, no, no. I was just going to say um, a sync agency and finding how you might fit a sync roster versus pitching directly to a music suit. Um, I know that two of you have sync rosters and or have or had. Um, what do you look for when you're taking on clients to be able to pitch to music supervisors on their behalf? Well, for me, uh, oh, <laughs> you go no, first. Go on. Oh, okay. Zoom, zoom. No, go on, <laughs> um, the overall production quality is really important because, as Sophie said, you know, a lot of people are producing in their bedrooms and things. Um, so the mix and master is really, really important. Obviously the song as well. Um, but that essentially is what I look for as two. In terms of composers, I will also listen out for the quality of the sound library they're using. Um, mm -hmm. Because if they haven't invested in say a great, you know, orchestral string sound, that's gonna make a massive difference to your tracks. And that, I've turned down many tracks because of that reason, when the overall song composition was really, really good, but the sound quality they're using is not good. So I would just say really invest in, in, in great plugins and sound libraries if you're and a are composer. You, are you quite happy to give that feedback to people? Again, the time issue. <laughs> um, if I have the time, then I will always try and assist and, and give feedback and help where I can. Um, and I do offer sync mentoring as well in all areas of, of sync, right? From the creative process through to like how to market your songs, things like that. I do assist with that side. Um, but you don't always have time to be able to respond to everyone that sends you music. like. I wish I could, but you just can't, otherwise you wouldn't get any work done. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great point. I think the, the thing that I mean, you know, I'm sure Sophie can attest in terms of things were very different like 10, when I started 10 years ago, it was like it was obviously much slower and there were less, less, you know, obviously you think is the hot ticket these days, especially with the way it always, it has been in the, especially in the last five years, it's like blown to the point where, I think even just myself, like I'm just a very small independent, you know, person doing what I do, and even I get overwhelmed with how many people send me music. And and the other thing is, that I think it's it's this reality of you know I'll have something in my inbox that I haven't even listened to it yet, and they're sort of like, oh, yeah, you know, we'd love to hear what you think. And it's like sometimes I don't actually have anything to say. Like sometimes I feel bad because I'm like, it's not that it's not bad. It's not that it's it's just either a I'm not going to necessarily. It's not what I'm looking for in terms of if I was interested in working with them or. I don't have any, you know, I don't have any specific feedback in terms of I don't have anything. And I think that's the thing that is people is challenging and it kind of relates to what Sophie was saying is, you know, I think there's this element of people, you know, it's obviously very frustrating. Like you send hundreds of emails, no one replies. Like I guess that element of it is really irritating and you know, it can feel like a lost cause at times. And I have picked up bands and cold emails, like I've worked with some amazing people just from like they were lucky that day that I happened to click on it. Like there's no you know, and I think the the thing you just got to just keep building relationships. And, you know, just someone rather than just this kind of generic, um, you know, thing. It's just very tough. Like as I say, the people kind of expect that they expect thing, and it's like just because you're a professional in this industry doesn't mean you can just keep. Get, and also, as I say, sometimes there's not nothing specific to say in terms of, you know, and I think what um. Amelia was saying is obviously it, you have to tread the line between because I've had situations where I've said, okay, well, this is what I think you need to improve on, and they take it very literally and very hard, and they're like, okay, I'm going to go and do that right now, and it's that tough because obviously it's my opinion. I'm just one person, like I'm pretty could be wrong, and you know, I think the other thing, and it even goes back to like talking about pitching to people is, you know, we've I've done panels with with big LA TV suits, and they're like, yeah, don't worry about it. I love getting emails from people. I love getting, you know, there's just like, please send as much music as you want. Like, I listen to everything. Yeah. And it just depends. Like, it's just, it just varies wildly. Like, it just really, like, some people just answer everything and they, they try and, or they have teams of people that just download everything. 
But I think the other thing is that the trust factor is huge. Like the trust thing is just so crucial these days in terms of why people go back to like trusted sources in terms of, you know, a sync rep is gonna, is gonna sign an agreement with you and get everything involved, get everything uh, ironed out in terms of who owns what, where it is, and then they're gonna make sure they have all the instrumentals ready to go. They make sure they have all the high res files. So that's why people just end up, and they can, they can clearly, you know, that's the other thing, whereas with bands and stuff, I think people just don't realize how quickly this runs, how quickly this goes, and how you've got, you know, you've got less than an hour to deal with something. And if you haven't got it all ready to go, you're going to lose out. So I think that's definitely the sync rep side. I mean, yeah, sync reps get mixed reviews from people. I think obviously because sometimes they don't land anything, but it's obviously just that's a very true. crowded marketplace these days. Yeah. That's right. That's all you can yeah. do these days. So say, Amelia, if somebody sends you something, and you haven't had a chance to listen or um, they really want to get your attention and they want to say follow up on their email, is there a sort of right and not wrong, but a, a, a polite and impolite way of maybe going about that? I don't, I don't mind people that, you know, politely follow up, but don't keep sending emails saying like, have you listened yet? Have you listened? <laughs> and just being really impatient because that is the quickest way for me not to listen and delete. Um, and just, yeah, just be respectful. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just say that really. Yeah, we're all people at the end of the day. That's yeah. yeah. And, and we're not like ignoring, we're just busy. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think why I realised this job is just uh, filing and deleting emails. That's why I've realised over the years. It's just uh, a lot of yeah, just trying to manage your inbox. I think that's why it's just yeah. you, as time has gone on, supervisors have started to have different email addresses for all the mailers and like trying to just because it gets too crazy. It's so so um you know, especially there's lots of lists that go around people you know, people sell emails, but and that's interesting because you'll see a sign just like unsolicited emails you know but it's tough i mean i can see like even lots of companies don't accept unsolicited emails which again it's just about either introductions or getting, getting in with someone who's a trusted trusted source of the especially if you're looking at the big la tv world it's, it's, uh, it's a really tough one to get in. yeah i have a good question here actually um from charlie and maybe this one can go to victoria but um do independent artists need to have a publisher or can they just work directly with the music soup to clear publishing? Um, you don't need to have a publisher, but like everyone's saying, having, you know, it helps because the publisher is a trusted source. So you're more likely to get syncs if you have a publisher, I would say, yeah. But you don't need them and you can build relationships through these kind of conferences and other ways like that. Yeah, I think that as long as you know about sync a little bit, or someone like Amelia, if you don't um, have someone guide you through the terms and check your email, if you really want to pitch something, nine times out of 10, sadly, it doesn't land. But if it does, be on the ball, answer the email, you know, and know what you're sort of dealing with. Um, and that makes you then an easy person to deal with in this music supervisor's Rolodex, which is always good. Mm -hmm. um, are supervisors more or less keen to sync a track that's been used on another project previously? That's a good one. Um, I, I would say that everyone wants to look like they've discovered a new track or <laughs> Or a great idea <laughs> whether the reality of that is different but I, it's an interesting question actually because in in advertising again um just because you're focusing on finding one the track uh for the script it uh, you know the the brief is full of old ads and tracks that they've been used so they you know that the john lewis effect as we call it um I don't even know if you have John Lewis out there actually. It's started. a department store in the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> they, they started doing sort of female, like, whimsical, female whimsical covers of big tracks. You know, mm. there was a Smith's track, there was a Beatles track, there was all that. And then and then that, that idea became so popular that everyone was like, we want a John Lewis. 
so it's kind of contradictory it's like well that's that's not your own creative idea that's someone else's who did it well so um but um it, it happens a lot you know but then but but I, like i would i would say ideally not they're looking for something fresh idea which something just made me think of actually covers are very popular for that very reason like it's been used somewhere before and it's popular or you know it's just a familiar track that everyone that you that you recognize but you want a fresh take on it you want something ownable um so so that that's very popular in advertising again because you want this sort of familiarity up for the brands and nostalgia and that sort of thing but do a fresh take on it and own own that version of it as it were mm -hmm. um yeah i think also in re in relation to trailers and tv promos the unreleased aspect is, can be quite important like especially in terms of um they really they really hate using cues that have been used on other projects so that's something that if you're if, if you're trying to get into the trailer tv promo world it's like very it's it, um they're very very particular about things that have, the tracks that have been associated with other films but that's something that they kind of get quite um quite picky about and again just the, the caliber of these days is so high in terms of trailer and tv promo work uh music side is, is the quality is so good these days that it's, um, if you really want to be in that space that's a very I mean, it has you know, slightly more specific needs in terms of you know, either bigger crescendo or like bigger, bigger elements. It just depends. But and again, covers are still very popular. Um, kind of like interesting takes on on things. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a pretty specific area of the simple world in terms of what works and what doesn't. Just in terms of builds or you know, kind of dynamic shifts. What if you were in? Sorry. So I was just going to say one last thing is like I've had things turned down which they absolutely love the track and it's perfect and then I've looked into it and seen that it's been used in the last 10 years even and it will just be off the table immediately um, and that's because brands don't want any association with other brands um, mm. so so if there's any connection from the audience with that brand on their new ad that it then it's not it's not a good thing for them so so yeah, I quite often never pitch things that I know that have been used on any adverts in the last five years, at least really. What if it is, so let's say Victoria, um, what if it's something that might've been used background in scene on say a Teen Mom episode or something, does that matter to you? And would you think about that for TV associations as much as ads and trailers would think about it as for brand associations? Uh, I would say like for TV, it's not as important for, as it is with advertising and stuff, especially if it's just going to sit in the background. Like, you know, I've sunk the same songs in over, you know, a couple of productions. It's just like a bar scene, blues rock, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not as important in my experience anyway. Um, I've also worked on a lot of TV shows that are, you know, say set in the 90s or the 80s and then they want music true to that era. So obviously those ones, it, it doesn't matter for as well. Yeah, that's funny. Some people don't notice or don't realize that your back catalog might actually be perfect, even if it's from a long, long time ago, because, you know, people, 80s is coming back. 90s is never going away, 70s, you know, if you need authentic 70s songs, you need it to be able to be cleared relatively easily. Um, there are probably go-to people for that sort of catalog. So I don't yeah. discount. I just, I just worked on a, a show actually, and they wanted all like legit 70s classic rock. Nice. Um, and like the, epi the episode budget or the whole series music budget went from like 10 grand an episode in the end, I think the, we spent like close to 600,000 on music. It's just like that music is expensive and it's usually with all the major labels and publishers. So they got the money for it in the end, but uh, yeah. I think Sometimes the other thing the that we haven't, and the other thing we haven't even mentioned, which is kind of nice is that, you know, with COVID, obviously everything, a lot of budgets have been very fluid. And I think music is obviously one of the things they chip away from when they have to factor in all these additional costs. And I think like that's or you know, I think that it's it's interesting because like, you know, it feels sometimes maybe it's like an it's just an an added excuse as to why they can't afford something, or like why they can't pay a certain amount of money. And I think that's been an interesting part of this, you know, this uh 
it's a shame that's like yeah in uh, lower budget tv shows obviously it can be very tough because you, you have a very limited budget to work with yeah um speaking of budgets though and knowing that we have a lot of indie artists in the crowd um i have a message from Anne janelle hi Anne. um it says, wondering what the best way to dive into sync is as an indie artist and how does one find a good sync rep, for example? And that sort of ties to a question that I have on my sheet, which was, um, what would you say are the biggest mistakes people make early in their sync career? So as an indie artist, of course you wanna get networking, you wanna meet people, but where do you start? Uh <clears throat> I say research the sync market. Um, also research um, what supervisors are working on. Um, research sync agencies as well. It always helps to approach them when you've done your research on who you're approaching. Because when you send out a blanket email, we all know, <laughs> and it's not gonna help. So when you've taken that time to do that little bit of homework, it goes a long way because you know that someone's taken the time out to, you know, find out what previous placements you've done or TV shows or things like that. Um, and it does. It, it does go a long way. I'm going to I'm going to pay more attention to, to that person than someone that's just sent out blank email, and especially when they don't get your name right either. That really annoys me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes yeah, I don't even change the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it's then, a previous company. Yeah, previous yeah. Company. I will always send, you know, a fairly polite email and just give a little bit of advice there as well, just just so they don't keep doing that because um, that won't get them very far. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with with the research because also you know think about. Um, you know, for, for people like me, it's a bit different because I work with all genres, all different medias, and so there's always scope for very varying genres and stuff. But if you look at the supervisor for The Crown, for example, and you're a, a heavy metal band, it's it's just not it's not going to work. It's not going to be relevant for her for her stuff. So um, I say her because I know it. I know who it is, it's a she. <laughs> um, so, so in terms of things like that, if your music really suits um, a particular uh, style of TV show or, or film, um, then then target those people specifically. And sync reps as well will will kind of have musical tastes, or you know, they might not just just um, rep every, every genre. So there might be people who are more relevant to you. I, I mean, it, all of this is tough, and and it's and that, that's why we do a lot of these sort of things because I think it's useful to, for people to hear the reality from our side as well. It's not that we're all just up our own bums. It's just there's so much being pitched at you all the time, every day. That that you know you can be helped if you were to respond to everyone. You just wouldn't like like Amelia said have to do any work. <laughs> um, so. So yeah, I think sync reps are a really good thing. You can you can message uh, supervisors direct. I am um, I have my I don't know if I should say this, my email on the on the website. So you know, feel free to send stuff through. Um, and I would also say when you're pitching or sending things, d just think about that again. What I've been saying, you know, if, if one in a hundred emails, then what's going to make it stand out um, for the supervisor to want to stop and listen to it um, or go back to it? Uh, so definitely don't drop whole catalogues and even mm. full albums and things mm. like that. I would, you know, pitch yourself. So here's my top three sync tracks, for example. One is in the pop realm. One is in the in, in the guitar music, whatever it is. Um, maybe yeah, a little bit of an explanation, perhaps where you think it, it would sit well. And then, or, you know, if you're very authentic to one genre or something, that's what I want to know, because then I might go back to that if I've got a very particular brief and know that, that, that I'm looking in the right world. And then I can go through the albums and stuff or contact you or the rap and say, I know that the, the sound is right, but have you got any lyrics which were about home, for example, mm. and then you can help me out that way. So... So yeah, a few bits of advice. Can I just say it as well? Don't take the same song to multiple agencies either, because um, if the or the different agencies, if they end up 
two of them pitching the same song, that's not going to be great for, for anyone involved. So just give different songs to different agencies if you want to work with a few agencies. Yeah, that can get confusing for the supervisor Messy. not knowing where to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have, I know we only have three minutes, but there's some really good questions here. So we'll try and go through really quickly. Um, LinkedIn, is that a good way to contact you if we can't find your email? No, I use it all the time. I don't use it, but that's it, personal preference. Yeah. I do. Yeah. So Amelia, I do, you must... I get, I get I it. and I don't think, you know, again, it's like, I, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I would say it's probably the same as the email, you know, I don't, it's, um, I do, I do go on it, but I don't, um, I definitely wouldn't say it more effective than emailing. I think doing it, because, you know, doing a personalized, as everyone said, doing a personalized, Especially just the usual stuff like, oh, I checked out that trailer you worked on, it's great. You know, that, and especially, as, as we said, like there's think agents have, you know, usually specialize in certain things or certain genres, so it's kind of definitely a work about finding one that fits. And again, from the supervision perspective, you know, that's what they'll be saying. And then it's like you, you know, you're going to go, okay, right, I need like one stop, uh, indie or whatever, you're going to know who's going to specifically rather, especially if the think agent just kind of has everything. Know, it doesn't people get a bit confused and they don't really know what to go to them for especially if, if um you know it's time limited which it usually is so basically use linkedin and those who respond may respond and those who don't won't <laughs> that's yeah. uh i think again just personalize it like i have i have like 400 plus requests in my box and it's just none of them are personalized but i'm not going to add random people i don't see that just because we have like one mutual friend i don't see Again, it's like a very yeah. odd social media anyway, but it's just interesting because people just added random, you know, music producers. It's like, I don't know what this is going to, what this will entail, you know, what's, what's the point of this, you know, it seems, it seems kind of pointless. But, yeah. That's true. Yeah. And um, a good one from Joanna here. Um, do you have to be able to edit your track quickly for sync if, um, if they want you to cut something out, etc.? Do you have to be prepared to do it basically in an hour? Or does it just matter? It depends on the time. Yeah, I would, I would I, sorry. I would say yes. It's really valuable if you can do that. Um, again, in the advertising world, what we're quite often looking for something that works in a thirty or a sixty second um, spot. So, you know, it might be. It, it, and a lot of the time, again, we don't have the time to edit it ourselves. We might be like, look, we we love that beginning bit and the end chorus can you do a quick edit or instrumentals are very valuable because there's often a lot of vo so they just want to add a few bits of lyrics but not the whole not the whole thing so if you're on hand and are able to do that then i then i think it's really useful but it's not one of those things don't don't preempt it because because the, there's no point you wouldn't want to waste your time but but it's also mm -hmm. not the end of the world so if you're not available and you can't then we can still pitch the track and you know we will try and edit ourselves where we can mm -hmm. um yeah um do we have i know it's 4 30 but really good question what's a good subject line for an e intro email to a music supervisor that you don't know yet hey music supervisor you don't know me yet mm -hmm. listen to me uh, i've had some good ones <laughs> yeah oh i've had yeah that's i, I don't know. The thing is, I read those ones where they're like, this is going to blow your mind, or like something so ridiculous. You're like, oh, okay. You're like, okay. <laughs> if you correctly spell out super casual, super, <laughs> super casual, <laughs> I don't even remember it. Super casualist, That's right. Yeah. Okay. You're just showing off now. <laughs> those, those, those can work. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to say, really. Certain things can. Can just be again, like you know, I think the big thing is just like great work on X, like something showing that you've done the research, showing that you've actually watched something they've worked on. I mean, I say this like in terms of uh, you know, I do that on the client side, and that doesn't work sometimes. But it shows you, you, know, you can literally be like, I love that ad you did, it was life changing, and they still work. So it doesn't, it doesn't always, it's, uh, it's a tricky one, but you just got to keep, keep going with it. So. Cool, I think Alison's gonna tell us to get off the internet. Well, 
Well, it was really, I was waiting for a good moment. I think there were some really fabulous questions and I wanted to just thank Janesta for being our amazing moderator. She came with a lot of questions. You and the audience came with some great ones to add. And I think it was a really round, um, well thought out conversation. Uh, I wanna thank Amelia and Sophie and Mark and Victoria for um, sharing their knowledge with us today. Hopefully everyone was able to take something away from this that will help them uh, gain some success navigating the sync world. Um, I know that most of you uh, on our panel will be participating in our export buyers program. So you might see them around um, at one-on-one -on -one meetings or they'll be attending some of your showcases if you are on our export stage. So thank you everyone. And uh, I hope to see you at some other panels today and the rest of the week. Awesome. awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys so for having me. Good thank luck. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>